today we're going to talk about um, how we kind of organize ourselves, how we live, and we're going to talk about something. I'm going to give you an, an overview uh, of something that we call the liturgical calendar. And so um, the church has um, a calendar that we use that we use throughout what we call the liturgical year. Uh, liturgy means uh, the work of the people. It's Greek and it, it comes from the word uh, liturgy comes from that the work of the people, which is what what is what is our work when we come together to pray. Worship, worship, praise God. Come together as community, pray and worship together. But we're kind of all used to a different calendar. It's our secular calendar that we have. It's Gregorian calendar that's been passed down through the ages. And so, um, when does the church year? When does the calendar year begin? And when does it end in our secular calendar? When does the year begin? January first. When does it end? December thirty-first. Okay. How's the year broken up? What season are we in right now? Summer. We're still in summer. We're getting really close to fall. Fall next week. Start a new season. So we we have four seasons that we're broken in. How else is the calendar broken up? Months, weeks, days. So we have this calendar that we work, we're all used to, and it breaks up because it's just something that we can use. That's very it's very handy to have. So. When we set up our first class, I told all of you we're going to start on September the 7th. And we're going to meet here at 7 o'clock, and this is year is 2023. And so, you know, the month, the day, the place, and, and that information. So the calendar is really important. Um, and we also, during the year, we celebrate holidays together. So what are some of the secular holidays that we celebrate? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, which is coming up. Yeah. We just finished celebrating a holiday. What was it? Labor Day. Labor Day. And then there was Memorial Day. Independence Day. And Fourth of July, Independence Day. Valentine's. It's always a special one. And all the different holidays. So we're used to a year being broken up that way. So when we look at uh, history, and like the Jewish history that, that we have is, is our history because Jesus and his apostles were Jews. They celebrated a, a history that was a, a religious history that they had, and they had a calendar that they work on. And the Jewish community to this day still use these calendars. Uh, at the beginning, first of all, they always... Celebrate Sabbath. There's about it's the their 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 Sabbath celebration, and when it's uh, it starts in when the Jewish community talk about a day, they don't talk about it starting like at midnight, whatever. For them, a day is sundown on one day to sundown the next day. So for them, the Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So when the Christians left that Jewish community, they basically were asked to leave um, and started celebrating on their own, they didn't celebrate on Saturday, they did on Sunday, because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. So Sunday was their day of worship, our day of, it's our day of worship, our day of celebration. And the church and the Catholic church even today still uses that same model, though, of sundown to sundown. So the Catholic Church looks at Sunday is sundown Saturday to sundown Sunday. That's why you know we have we come together to worship on Saturday night, which is our Sunday worship, all the way up till even Sunday evening uh, before sundown. So we we continue to look at the day the same way the Jewish people did. You have uh, one of your handouts shows this calendar right here. There are the different uh, celebrations. Of those have not been handed out, Jeff. Oh, okay. They need to be handed out. Oh, sorry. That's it. Okay. Thank you. 
So as everybody gets it, you're going to look at this calendar. And what it does, it lists particularly seven major feasts that actually the Jewish community still celebrate today. And besides uh, Sabbath, or Sabbat, uh, they, they, be, they celebrate Passover. Uh, they call it Peshach. Because for them, their, their, their um, salvation event was the Passover. And they were, in, in, um, they were released from uh, slavery in Egypt um, because the angel of the Lord came and passed over the houses, their houses because they had the blood of the lamb spread over it and, and killed all the firstborn of all the Egyptians and those that did not... Um, did not, we're not celebrating and we're not following that tradition, the Jewish tradition. And so they had salvation. So they used Passover, which is one of their major holidays, one of their major feasts. Then they have two others that they kind of combine now. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread and First Fruits. It's the idea of, um, it celebrates the first fruits of the year, it comes in spring, and it also celebrates the law of Moses that Moses gave to their people, and that's the law they follow, the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses, the rule of Moses. And so the unleavened bread and the first fruits are, are a celebration that they celebrate together now. The Feast of Weeks was Pentecost, and, and when we look at that, that's the Feast of Enlightenment, the Feast of Light. Um, and uh, at Pentecost. Um, then they have 10 days of really deep introspection into their faith of the things they've done wrong, which end with Rosh Hashanah, um, um, during Rosh Hashanah. And then um, after that, after those starts with Rosh Hashanah, then it starts, ends with the day long before, the Day of Atonement. And so that's their time of coming together to looking at their lives and, and asking God forgiveness for their sins. And, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, it's, it's the one where they come together to celebrate um, in, in a... Um, they put big booths up and they're celebrating the final harvest and light. And they come together. You read the Gospels and Scripture, you can see that Jesus celebrated several of these feasts that are described, um, and a lot of in Matthew, mostly, uh, the different feasts that Jesus and his disciples would have celebrated. And then, then, of course, they have Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the celebration, the eight days of uh, where the temple was... Uh, was basically and that sacrilege was done on the on their temple, and they only had enough oil. They had to burn oil for eight days, but they only had enough for one day. But it was a miracle that the oil lasted all eight days, so that the temple could could be then scourged of all the the, the sacrifices and all the, the terrible things that were done in it, and were made holy and sacred again. So these are the things that Jesus would have celebrated. Uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and the Jewish people got together in around 90 A.D., and there were different sects of Judaism. And at that time, um, there were the, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Essenes, different sects of Judaism, kind of like we have different sects of Christianity today. And the Christians, or the followers of the way, were another sect of Judaism at that time. Because what they did is they would go to the temple and pray. Then they would come back to celebrate what Jesus told them to do at the Last Supper, uh, which was to eat his body and drink his blood. And so they would do; they would be doing both up until this time. But the Jewish community said, this teaching that they have on Jesus is too far afield. That's probably why the temple was destroyed, and they just got rid of anything that they felt caused that to happen, and so they basically expelled the Christians from the temple. And a large majority of them went to Ephesus in Turkey at that time. So what they did then is start celebrating their own rites. They took some of the some of the feasts that were the Jewish feasts and they Christianized them, and then they also looked at 
Jesus' life and the things that he did. And so they came together and, and put together a, a way of celebrating the year uh, from a Christian standpoint. And we still do that today. It's called uh, liturgy. Like I said, liturgy is the work of the people. It's coming together to pray. And we break it down into a liturgical calendar. Um, and this calendar is kind of like the secular calendar. It has seasons. It has days that we celebrate certain days. It has times of the year. And it's, it kind of models a little bit of the feast that the Jewish community did and, and the calendar that they had. Um, here we can see Pope Innocent, who was Pope from 1198 to 1216, introduced the fact that there is a sequence of colors that are used for these different seasons to differentiate what season you're in. So when you look at the universal Catholic, Roman Catholic church, and you go into any church at any time, you can see the vestments the priest is wearing, you can see the colors on the altar, you can, you can, you'll know what season of the year it is because it's universal. We have a universal church that we celebrate together, and the, the Roman Rite, the Latin Rite Church, will use these particular colors um, um, at, at the particular seasons. So we're going to talk about those colors. You always wondered that when you go yes. into the church? It's really good just to see that, and then you know, you know what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to go through this calendar. Um, and we're going to start with, unlike the secular calendar, the church year starts, the church year starts here at the ad, beginning of Advent season. And Advent, um, it lasts for four Sundays before Easter. It's always, I mean, before, <laughs> four Sundays before Christmas, I'm sorry. So it's four Sundays before Christmas. And so we have the Advent season, and that begins the year. So our church year begins four weeks, four Sundays before Christmas. It's usually somewhere around Thanksgiving weekend or the weekend after is, is when that begins. And we call this season Advent. Um, the color you can see on your chart, the color is purple, and it's a time of, of, of of looking at, um, looking within ourselves, it's, it's a time of, of uh, kind of introspection on, on how we're doing and what we're doing. Uh, it lasts those four Sundays. Uh, the meaning of Advent is coming. We are waiting for the coming of Christ. Um, at, the, at, the, at Christmas, it will be his first coming. But during this period of time, we're also waiting for his second coming, for a second coming to come. So we want to be sure that we're ready because we don't know when that day or time is going to happen. So some of the readings and some of, some of the things we're going to see is waiting for a second coming. And then we're also waiting and looking at his coming in our lives every day, every day of our lives, and, and being open to that and being open to God working in our lives every single day. So during this Advent season, it's that time of, of really waiting and coming, and, and it's very countercultural because Christmas weekend is a signal for, in fact, some people even, I mean Christmas, I did that again, sorry, Thanksgiving week is the signal for you that put up your Christmas tree, you start putting up the Christmas direction, you do, start wrapping presents and all that kind of stuff. The church doesn't do that. Christmas, we don't celebrate Christmas until Christmas. And so you're going to see in the church, we're going to be looking at this time and you're going to listen to the reading because we're waiting for the coming of Christ. And it's, it's, it, you're, you're not going to see those kind of things in the church. One of the things that, uh, symbols that you're going to see, and, and most churches uh, do this now, we'll have a special area in the church, usually at the front near the altar, where we'll have what's called an Advent wreath. And that Advent wreath then is uh, where we look at it uh, each week, 
one of the candles is lit. It's greenery. It shows um, everlasting life and greenery, and, and it's a circle, and then it's an unending circle. And then we have the four candles. And so the first two weeks, the prayers and everything that go along with it, we, we light two purple candles. The third week is, oh, we're getting closer and closer to Christmas. Woo-hoo. So it's it's a symbol of joy. And so we have a pink ca- candle that we light that week. And then the fourth Sunday, the fourth weekend, we light another purple candle. So that's, that's just something. There's also something that I did with my kids all the time. It's called a Jesse tree, and you can look those up. You just can see them. You can get a little tree, and, and you can get symbols of the genealogy of Jesus, all the way from Jesse, the stump um, and, and root, all the way to his birth. And you can put one on each day during Advent. So there's things that you can do during the Advent season. Any questions about that? Okay. I'm just going to do a real, we're going to hit all these again before the season happens. I'm just going to do a really quick overview. So when Advent's over with, that's when we celebrate Christmas. And Christmas is, you heard the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas? That's what Christmas is about. We celebrate the twelve days of Christmas. The end of those twelve days is the epiphany. And that's, if we look at scripture, that's when the Magi came and they found Jesus. Epiphany means manifestation. It's the manifestation of something. And so the Magi have traveled that great distance, and they actually find Jesus on Epiphany. And we also continue to celebrate until that weekend, which is usually the baptism of the Lord. And at that point in time, that's when Christmas ends. So... On Christmas Eve, you're going to see the decorations in the church. You're going to see the nativity set. Um, the decorations are there, the lights. The church is all decorated during Christmas. So it's going to happen during the Christmas season. Where, like I said, countercultural is a world. People are taking their Christmas tree down on the day after Christmas. So we're, this is the beginning of the celebration of Christmas uh, in the church. Then we come upon a season that's called Ordinary Time. And it's, we just prepared for Christmas. We've been waiting, the coming. We've celebrated the birth of our Savior, his baptism. And we begin to see his teaching in his life. And so this, this next season we look at, it's called Ordinary Time in that we're going to be looking at what are some of the things in his life? What are the things that we've learned as we listen to the readings and we listen to the stories Jesus told and the story his apostles told about him? During this period of time, this is the time we're looking at. This is, you know, we just celebrated this beautiful, wonderful um, holiday, this, this special celebration. And, and now we're, we're going, what are some of the things? What, what does that do? What does that call to mind for us? What, what should we be doing in our lives to, to live this as we prepare for it? And so ordinary time is, um, well, I had Christmas epiphany, sorry. Um, epiphany was the Magi. Um, the color, of course, was white during Christmas. The duration is the 12 days. So, And then as we get ready for this ordinary time, um, it, it's a season of grace. And there's this beautiful prayer that I found. God of eternity, as I walk the path of ordinary time, help me to count the many ways you are present. In the comings and going of family, friends, co-workers, and acquaintances. In the sounds of summer and the beauty of your magnificent creator. In the daily routines and responsibilities that make up the rhythm of my days. Make of time extraordinary. And I seek to become more attuned to your presence. Amen. So that's, the, that's what we do during that time. To become closer to our relationship with Christ. And then we come into one of the uh, really um, major seasons of the year as preparation uh, 
um, for our highest holy day. And that's called Lent. So we begin this Lenten season. It's a longer period of time. So when we look at it, it lasts 40 days. The color is purple again. Again, a time of introspection, a time of looking deep within ourselves as to what are some of the things we heard, we saw Jesus in, we learned about his, his, his birth, and we begin to learn and, and study about his life and what he's calling us to do. So where are we falling short on that? What are some of the things that we need to do during this, this Lenten season to prepare ourselves for Easter, for his resurrection? And so during these 40 days, it's time of prayer, fasting, and it's called almsgiving or works of love. So the color is, is uh, purple. Lent begins on Ash Wednesday. It lasts for 40 days, and that doesn't include Sundays. Sundays are many Easter's, so if you're counting on the calendar, it begins on Ash Wednesday. Do not count the Sundays, because there's about six of them in there. And what do we do during that time? Like I said, we do, we do something. Um, we call it giving up something, uh, but it doesn't have to be something uh, that, that we give up to eat or to do. Some people give up uh, social media, like Facebook or things like that, that are taking you away. Because the thing is that what you're sacrificing and, and the thing that you can give up is your time, your time that you were spending away from being closer your relationship with Christ, so going to Mass more, praying more, um, actually doing things for others, looking outside yourself. What are some of the needs of your neighbors or your friends, or what are some of the things that you can do outside yourself? And so during this, this season of Lent, sacrificing our time, sacrificing something that gives us more time to read scripture, we have a chaplain here that will visit um, one of these nights um, and it has what we call perpetual adoration and so the Eucharist um, the, uh, the consecrated uh, body of soul and divinity of Jesus Christ is on display in there and people come in and spend an hour just to pray uh, to pray for other people to pray for just to to read scripture, to, to listen to Jesus. You know, a lot of times when we pray, we, want, we do all the talking, and we need to kind of listen to. We want to hear what Jesus is saying to us. What's God saying back to us um, when we're praying? So just praying, fasting, doing works of love and mercy happens. This is what we do during the, during the Latin season. And it's in preparation. Preparation for what? Easter. 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 Preparation for Easter. Our highest holy day. This is this is that time um, in the church calendar where basically everything we've been doing is leading up to Easter. And and as we've studied Jesus' birth, his life, and now now we did study his death. And at Easter we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. He is what, what, it, what our faith is all about. And so when we, when we study that, um, we, we look at this season of, of, of Easter. And it begins with Holy Week. Uh, and Holy Week uh, starts the Sunday before Easter Sunday. It's called Palm Sunday. And one of the things we do here are palms are distributed We'll meet over here in, in the gym, and we'll process over to the church uh, in, 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 in remembrance of Jesus' triumphant um, entrance into Jerusalem, where the people spread palms in, in front of him. And these palms are blessed, and anything that's blessed then is brought home and put in a very special place. Um, those palms on... Ash Wednesday, which was the beginning of Lent, we come to church um, 
mass is offered usually two or three times during that day. And during that mass, um, we are asked to come forward to <coughs> prepare for land and, and, and to look at, to remember that we're dust and to dust we're going to return, but also to turn away from sin and turn toward the gospel. And if this is something we're willing to do during this Lent season, then, then we have the sign of the cross made on our forehead with ashes. These ashes come from the palms from before that we're turning in that are then burned in a very special way and, and mixed with holy oil. And then they're the ones that are put on our forehead for us to remind us that this is this is what we're going to be doing during the Lenten season. And so those palms are the new ones we receive then on Palm Sunday. The Tuesday of Holy Week here in this diocese, the Archbishop has a special celebration up at the cathedral called the Chrism Mass, um, where all of the priests come and they renew their allegiance to the bishop and also um, all of the oils that are going to be used in the various sacramental celebrations in all the parishes in this diocese during the year are consecrated. So they're brought forward and the bishop blesses them and then uh, someone from each parish brings them back. Um, the old oils are put in holy ground and the new oils are used for that year. So those of you who choose to come in the church and, and be confirmed, it will be with the new oil that was just blessed on, on Tuesday of Holy Week. So Lent ends on Anybody know when Lent ends? Holy Thursday. Holy, who said that? They did. Marshall. Holy Thursday evening. Lent ends on Holy Thursday evening. It begins on Ash Wednesday, and it ends on Holy Thursday evening. We come together for this beautiful celebration, of, and it's it's got a, a couple of parts to it. Um, if you look at this, First picture over here. One of the things that this was is Jesus is celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. What he did was go to each one of them and wash their feet, and that's symbolic of his kingship or his priesthood is one of service. And so our priests do the same thing. They have people that represent the community come up, and and they wash their feet because that's what we're called to do. We're called in ministry to go out and minister to people by not lording it over them, not expecting to be worshipped or looked up to or something, but that we do a service to them, that we, we reach out to our brothers and sisters and, and do them service. So that's part of, of what uh, Holy Thursday is about. The other part is the institution of the Eucharist, where Jesus takes his, the bread and the wine and said, this is my body and this is my blood. And it also is the institution of the priesthood, because he tells his apostles, who are the new priests, that you do this in remembrance of me. And so the priesthood begins on a Holy Thursday evening. And the priesthood that we have today, that Father is right here, this is, this is the beginning of that. Uh, the institution of that priesthood was on Holy Thursday evening. This begins what we have, we call the tritium. It means three days. And so these three days from Holy, the evening of Holy Thursday to the evening of Easter Sunday are the three days of the tritium. And they all go together like one celebration. We have different things that we look at it or we celebrate during each one of these days, but they all three go together. They're, they're all one. So it begins with this Mass. At the end of this Mass, the, uh, the church, um, the priest, and the Hope community uh, takes the, the hosts that were consecrated that were um, that were may, remaining from, old, that were not used at communion on Holy Thursday evening. And 
they take it in a procession here. We take it over to the chapel here, where it's it's displayed um, in adoration until midnight at night. And then if you go into any Catholic church on Friday, you're going to see that the tabernacle where we keep the hosts that are there that were consecrated during the Mass, but that are there to bring to the homebound and the sick or, or whatever. Um, the tabernacle doors are always shut, but on Good Friday, you'll notice the tabernacle doors are open and the tabernacle is empty. There's no Mass that's ever said, we don't consecrate on Good Friday. Christ died on Friday and that, that's what we, we acknowledge that day. So Good Friday, is the day that we acknowledge the cross, that we we come together. It's not mass, it's more of a, a communion service where we come to celebrate together, but what we what we what we do is we spend our time um, looking at the cross. The cross is brought in in a beautiful procession and then each one of us have the opportunity to go up individually and somehow acknowledge the cross either by touch or kneeling or kissing or whatever feels comfortable to you. But it's 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 the cross that we're renovating. <laughs> Not renovating. Where adoring. Huh? Adoring. Adoring. We're adoring the cross. Adoring. Vener the venerate the cross. Venerating, thank you. We're venerating the cross on, on Good Friday. And so we acknowledge uh, his passion and his death, and, and we tell that story of the passion. Holy Saturday begins with a time of um, stillness and waiting. Yeah, again, it, it's a time of, of waiting and anticipation uh, for the resurrection of our, of our Lord. And so during the day on Holy Saturday, it should be I know we're dyeing Easter eggs and putting Easter baskets together and doing all kinds of things like that. But it also should be a time when we spend some time in prayer and, and remembering that we're preparing for the resurrection of, of Christ. Um, Easter begins on sundown. So on Saturday at sundown is when we celebrate um, the Easter Vigil. And for those of you that choose to become Catholic, this is when it happens. And if you're going to be confirmed, we do it at the Easter Vigil. It's a celebration that begins with light. Um, the church, we leave on Friday in darkness, and we come in in darkness on, um, on Saturday evening. And then this beautiful fire um, is, is, is lit and the Easter candle is lit from that. We're going to go a lot more detail on this, but if you've never been to the Easter Vigil Mass, it's a beautiful Mass. It does last for about two and a half hours, about. Uh, we go through a lot of readings and the history, and it, it's just it's just a beautiful, beautiful celebration. But everyone has gets a candle. The whole church is lit. And we get this celebration, and that's when Baptist, we have baptisms, and people receive in the church, and, and it's it's a it's, it's a it's our biggest celebration of the year. It's just phenomenal. It's just beautiful. And so we continue that celebration on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, where we still have mass that's offered here at church. This is our. This is what we're waiting for. Is Easter, and because it's such a special holiday, it doesn't last a short period of time, but it lasts for 50 days. So when we look at Easter, the Easter season, it lasts for 50 days, and it doesn't end until this week right here. It's called Pentecost. You remember when we did the Jewish feast, they also had a feast of Pentecost. And what would happen is that people from all different um, countries, Jewish people, would come into Jerusalem to worship um, and, and to celebrate Pentecost, uh, which was the giving of the law and of light, too. And so during this, this Pentecost season, 
Um, this is when, if you read in the Acts of the Apostles, the, the apostles were frightened. Uh, Jesus had been killed. He'd been, you know, hung on the cross. And, and so this, you know, this is our Savior, and, and he's not there. So they were still hiding in an upper room. And if you read, it says that the wind came and the doors flung open, and it was like tons of fire were dancing on the apostles' heads, and they received the Holy Spirit in such a huge way that gave them the courage to go out and start preaching the good news. And you see Peter preaching, and that thousands are are converted and are baptized and brought into into Christianity. Um, it symbolized. Uh, it's the 50 days mm -hmm. at Easter ends. It was Pentecost season, which is one week. Um, it celebrates the Jewish Feast of Weeks, celebrating the harvest and giving the law to Moses. Um, the color that you're going to see is red. And red is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. That and the dove. The dove is the other symbol. This is my favorite window. This is in St. Peter's in Rome, and it's toward the back of the church, and when the light shines just right, and you're looking at it, it's like the dove is just coming right toward you. The Holy Spirit is coming toward you, and engulfing you with, with all the blessings. Um, it's just, it's, like I said, it's my favorite window. Um, and so the colors red, the symbols are fire and a dove representing the Holy Spirit. We also consider Pentecost because the fact the apostles went out and started preaching and converting the birthday of the church. So we have the liturgical calendar and we come back to another period of ordinary time really extraordinary time and because again we celebrated this this magnificent wonderful uh, holiday um, this, the celebration of Easter the resurrection of our Lord um, there's there's nothing that means more in, in our, to our faith than the fact that Jesus rose from the dead opened the doors of heaven for us and it's because of that that we have our salvation and so this is our time. This is what we're in right now. We're in ordinary time. I have the green cloth, cloth on my little table right here uh, to celebrate uh, the fact that we're in this ordinary time. So this is the time when you look at the readings that we go through. What, you know, what are the teachings of Jesus? What are the things that we need to be doing in our lives? During that Lenten season, Hopefully we found things that we needed to do differently and how we were not uh, worshiping God like we should or doing his work that he's calling us to do. And so during this ordinary time, this is the time to do it, to put it into action, to, to, to look at and to grow closer in our relationship with Christ as we get ready to begin um, a new year. So this will end at uh, the beginning of Advent, and we will start a new year. Okay? Got it? Okay, good. All right. We have, what when we come together to worship, either daily or uh, on the weekend on Sunday Mass, we have a book, um, and this book is put together with readings, and these are readings that you're going to find in the Universal Catholic Church. And so these readings are set up um, in, in a special way. So first of all, if for Sunday Mass, for the weekend Mass, um, there are, it's, it's broken up in a three-year cycle. We are currently in cycle A. And if you see down here in cycle A, most of the reading, the gospel reading, are from the book of Matthew. So when you come together at, at Mass during cycle A, you're going to be reading mostly from the book of Matthew. Um, when we begin Advent, those four Sundays before Christmas, we'll move on to cycle B, um, which 
then will be more readings from the Gospel of Mark. And then the next year we'll go to, to, uh, to year C, and most of those readings then will be from Luke. So the church is broken up into those, those three-year cycles for our Sunday reading. When you come to Mass on Sunday, the first reading is usually from the Old Testament, um, except during the Easter season when it's usually from the Acts. We see how the early church responded after Jesus' resurrection. So a lot of them are Acts in the Old Testament. They always have a psalm that, that we pray. And then there's a second reading, which is usually one of Paul's writings uh, from the New Testament. And then the third reading is always one of the Gospels. So depending on what uh, year we're in, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, then you'll see during the Easter season, you'll see John a lot from the Gospel of John. And also at special times of the year, that's when we pull from that really beautiful Gospel of, of John. So any questions about that? Okay. Yes? What's that symbol in the middle that looks like a P in the text? The Pax Christi. Okay. This one right here? Yes, what is that? That's the symbol of Jesus Christ. That's his initials. And the symbol is called Pax Christi. Um, and, and it means Jesus Christ. You'll see that on the altar at St. Joe's, our main church. Um, it's there in the middle of the altar, uh, symbolizes Jesus Christ. It's also the <clears throat> letters, this, the first two letters of Christ in Greek, Chi and Rho. Mm -hmm. So it kind of comes from that, that's that tradition too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good question, thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> so, we also have daily readings. And if you come to Mass at, at church here, like at St. Joseph, we have Mass pretty much every day of the week, unless something happens when we have to, you know, the issue's not available that. And so these readings are done in two-year cycles. Um, on odd years, like we're in now, we're in year one, and even years, we do year two. So if you, if you were to keep up with all of the, the readings that we have during a year, and particularly during that three-year cycle, you're going to hit 90% of scripture that is going to be either proclaimed to you and hopefully that you spent time to, to sit and study it. It's, it's really important to, to look at the readings ahead of time before you come to Mass. And, and to study them and to spend a little bit of time with them. Um, I'm gonna give you some um, places that you can go that have apps uh, and things that you can find those readings. Um, it's, they're pretty well available on so many different sites. Um, um, and on the internet, you can, you can find those readings for, the, for, the, for each week and, and and where we are and what day we're in. Okay? Judy, can I say something? Sure. What's really cool, what's really cool about the lectionary system that, that uh, the church offers is every Sunday you get these new set of readings. And because of that, the church basically gives you this opportunity every week to do a Bible study. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, the Gospels. You actually can use that throughout the whole week. You could read the Sunday readings on Monday for the one Sunday coming up. You could spend time with it every day, reading, studying, and, and entering. So the church is kind of calling us to that, to live the, the scriptures and to, and, to, and to breathe them in in that way. So it's kind of a neat system that the church has set up for us every single week, there's a set of readings that you can actually take to prayer or you could use to, to pray, to have a study. Absolutely. And, and what's neat about it, it's the same readings in every Catholic, the Catholic Church is universal. So anywhere you go in the world, it's going to be the same readings for that day. It's the church 
every single Catholic church will have those readings that day. Um, there are very few exceptions, mainly if it might be the, uh, the day of celebration of their particular saint that maybe their community is named after or something and might kind of, but 99.9999% of the time it's going to be the very same readings of every Catholic church you go to, which is beautiful. And, and the Mass is the same in every Catholic church, which is also, also beautiful. Um, <clears throat> just really quick, I want to talk a little bit about the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, what it is. I think it was Melanie that asked um, what a catechist was. And so... Um, when we look at the catechism, um, you're going to find it in, in two forms, primarily. One is a hardcover, like this one, and the other one, which, and all of these are readily available on Barnes and Noble or any, any place you sit down. Or our local Catholic bookstore right and, over here. Uh, yeah. St. <laughs> Joseph. We do, we do, yeah, I was going to get to that. Um, we do have our own bookstore. Um, and, and then the paperback version of it. We kind of talked a little bit about what catechism meant. Um, and it means to echo. So a catechist, uh, it's a Greek, it comes from a Greek, meaning to echo. So a catechist is not just a teacher, but they're echoing the Word of God. We're sharing with you not only the head knowledge, not only the concrete knowledge, but also we're echoing the word of God. Our faith is inter, you know, intertwined in, in everything that, that we teach you. And so a catechism is a, anything that's an ism is, is a, a book of instruction of some sort. So a catechism is that. It's a book of a manual of religious instruction. The church in, in 1992, I think, um, decided to put together a book that puts all of the teachings of the Catholic Church in one place, and it's called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And so um, when we look at this book, it comes in four pillars, basically. The way it's broken up is four pillars. And so if you're looking at a catechism and you open it up, the first part has to do with our creed. And so, um, it's called the profession of faith. And basically it talks about what do we believe as Catholics. Um, it really takes the creed that we say at Mass every Sunday, the Nicene Creed, and it breaks it open. And what's great about it, there's all kinds of references on the bottom of where this these, these teachings came from, whether from scripture or one of the councils or one of the church fathers helped elaborate uh, this teaching. And so it, it's, you'll find it in the creed. So it starts with, what do we believe? And so if that's, we get together and we know what we believe, then how do we celebrate it? And it's called the celebration of the Christian mystery. So this is what we believe. When we come together, how do we celebrate it? So it talks about the mass, it talks about sacraments, it talks about how do we, how do we, what do we do with it? We believe this, and then what do we do with it? The next one is called Life in Christ. And it has to do, this is what we believe, this is how we celebrate. Hey, how do we go out in the world and live, and live it? So it has a lot to do with morality. Uh, the morality that we have with the church. And the last one that really is intertwined on all of them and holds them all up is Christian prayer spends time talking about what prayer is, and there are seven petitions in that Our Father that we started with and praying today, and they're broken down um, in that last section of this catechism. And, and what it does is just talks about what a sponsor is and what a sponsor isn't. And so everybody who is going to celebrate in the sacraments of Easter needs to have someone that's walking this journey with them. 
a sponsor is someone that's just living their faith. It's not someone that necessarily has the answers to everything. That's why you're coming here. Supposedly, those of us who are catechists, at least if we don't know the answers, we know where to look to find them. So we'll be able to answer your questions. So everyone needs to have a sponsor to go on this journey with them. There's no big hurry to find one. Um, if you don't know somebody, uh, that's what we're here for, is to help you find someone. What we're hoping, if there's someone here in this class, uh, we're missing a lot of the Catholics tonight. They all decide to leave town on it, uh, that are eligible to be sponsored. And so when I break you down into the uh, small groups next week, Hopefully you get to meet someone, and if somebody, you know, if y'all hit it off and it works really well, then we might want to ask that person to be your sponsor. Uh, if, I'd appreciate it if it were someone from this faith community. Uh, we've had people use sponsors before from other Catholic parishes, and it's really difficult because um, afterwards there's not that person there that's part of the community to bring you uh, to the different functions and to invite you and to uh, let you know about the different ministries and tell you about you know, what, what, what's important to them and how they, how they live their faith. I kind of like us, I like in the sponsor to when you, if you've ever gone on a tour bus or a tour of everything, there's a person at the front with the microphone that said, Oh, they were going by such and such castle, and it was built in such and such and such and such. And we're going to stop by, and we're going to take a tour, and there'll be someone there, and they're going to tell you all about it, what it was built, and all that stuff. And then the sponsor is someone that's sitting beside you. I've been there before. Be sure to bring a sweater. It's cold. <laughs> that's what a sponsor is. It's not the person that tells you when the castle was built and what all the different things that are in it. But it's those living things. That and that's what this is. This 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 journey that we're taking together is not just pouring the knowledge into your head, but also what the purpose of it is is to have that personal relationship with Christ, to journey with Him, and to kind of walk with someone who is living their faith, is going to that.